<clears throat> this is exciting. This is the first time I've ever wore a mic before I had a talk, so I'm psyched about that. Um, so yeah, I work at Oxford, Big Data Institute, doing statistical genetics. I'm focused on malaria. I'm not talking about the PhD today, though I will talk about malaria. So let's start off uh, with the basics. Malaria is a parasitic disease. Um, it infects red blood cells in human beings. It's transmitted between human uh, beings by mosquito bites. If you're infected with malaria, um, it'll consume your hemoglobin, which causes anemia and in some cases, um, death. The numbers are pretty harrowing. So 50% of the population is at risk globally. There's 220 million cases in 2017, causing 440,000 deaths. 92% uh, of those were in sub-Saharan Africa and 70% of those were in children under the age of five. Um, what's also scary is that in uh, 2008, resistance to the frontline antimalarial was detected in Western Cambodia. Um, so this manifests as a delayed clearance time. In this study, there were 60 patients and two of them had a reemergence uh, three weeks later. The frontline antimalarials called artemisinin-based combination therapies or ACTs. So this is 2008 and then 2014, it spread all across Southeast Asia. You can see in these pie charts, the red portion is resistant parasites. So what Malaria epidemiologists um, were quite worried about this because it's familiar, actually. So chloroquine was the frontline antimalarial post-World War II. Um, it was developed in the 1950s, and by 1957, there was resistance in Thailand. By 1973, it spread across Southeast Asia. 1978, it was on the eastern seaboard of Africa. By 1982, it was all across the African continent. And this was actually coincident with a steady increase in deaths due to malaria in Africa. So it went from about 1 million in 1980 to um, 1.6 million in 2005, so it's millions of lives. Um, not the only drug that had this fate, sulfadoxin pyrimethamine was rolled out once it was clear that chloroquine was going into the bin. It started off in Southeast Asia uh, where, where it was introduced. Resistance uh, emerged in Southeast Asia in the 80s. By the 90s, it was in Africa, and now it's all, all across Africa, essentially. So malaria epidemiologists are worried that the next step for ACT resistance is Africa, basically. So it would be great to have some sort of surveillance me mechanism so we could detect if ACTs came to Africa. The problem is therapeutic efficacy studies are they're invasive and labor intensive. So what they entail generally is a pa patient goes to hospital, um, blood smears are taken periodically, um, and the parasitemia is checked under a microscope and you try and detect whether there's this delayed clearance. Um, so obviously this takes time and you can't really uh, roll it out to scale. Um, however, in 2014, molecular markers for this resistance were detected. Um, so there's a suite of mutations in this gene called kels in the propeller domain, which will confer, confer this resistance phenotype. So now we have another handle on this problem. Um, essentially, we can use genetics to survey for ACT resistance, and theoretically, it could be done from a dry blood, blood spot. So this was the state of affairs when George Busby, who's in the audience, um, noticed an opportunity. The opportunity was called the Land Rover Bursary. And what this is, essentially, is a grant from Land Rover supported by the Royal Geographic Society. That includes a brand new Land Rover Discovery and 30,000 pounds to conduct a scientific um, journey or expedition. And so George proposed that we throw a proposal in, and the proposal looked like this. One, convert the Land Rover into a mobile sequencing lab, trial and country sequencing to detect drug resistance, and two, raise awareness, basically, uh, to try and keep uh, malaria on the global development agenda. So uh, we, we uh, obviously, at the core proposal, had the nanopore, and as far as the challenging journey um, portion went, I think we put, took that pretty seriously. Um, so we went from Walvis Bay, Namibia, to Mombasa, Kenya. Um, yeah, we won the grant, and this is the team. So Isaac Ganai was a uh, medic who was on the team, George was the lead, and then uh, on my shoulders was sort of getting the sequencing running. So pre-launch, this is not an stressful time. Um, this is a basic sketch of the lab. It has all the normal stuff that I made early on. Um, the workflow goes like this, and it's heavily inspired by Lucky's work, published in Scientific Reports, he's gonna talk later. So uh, extraction with a quiagen kit, do a selective whole genome application, I'll talk about that in a second, PCR of antimalarial genes, and then barcode by ligation follow followed by sequencing by ligation. So the selective whole genome application comes from a paper that's um, published by the group I'm in actually at Oxford, um, and essentially it's just a way of doing enrichment for the parasite DNA. So in an extract from a dried blood spot, about 1% by weight of the DNA will be parasite, which is not really great going into PCR. If you do this whole genome application, you can get that up to around 60%, and the PCRs work quite robustly. I'm showing that here. So in these two panels, all my PCRs are failing. This was an artificial mixture of parasite and human DNA at 1%. And then in these, these two panels, I have um, done that SWGA reaction. And with or without cleanup, the PCRs all look pretty good. 
So while I was doing that, Land Rover was painting this car, which was pretty cool. Um, and more importantly, uh, they were outfitting the back so that we could ship reagents basically all the way across Africa. And so it, uh, it had a leisure battery that was powered by the motor, and uh, that powered a fridge freezer. And then there was also pelle cases, which I crammed all the lab equipment into. Yeah, so the, the drive in total was 7,351 uh, 7, kilometers. I have 10 minutes. Oh, that's lots of time. Um, so yeah, I'm going to skip through this quite quickly, but I'll, I'll cover the main points. So first, we met Davis, uh, Professor Davis Mumbengegwe in the University of Namibia. We did lots of cool stuff with him, but we didn't have time to sequence there, so I'll just move forward to the sequencing part. Um, and that was at the National Malaria Elimination Center in Lusaka, Zambia. So the first experiment, we basically deployed the equipment in the lab space there. Um, we did six samples, so four were Zambian field samples. We had 3D7, which is the malaria reference genome, and a Cambodian sample as a positive control. And I sequenced uh, four genes. So we have the AT ACT resistance conferring gene, um, the chloroquine resistance, and the um, py pyrethm pyrimethamine resistance gene. So the run went pretty well. We got uh, 20 gigs of data, uh, which is more than we need for this, obviously, but I was just kind of seeing where it would go. Um, and actually, it stopped due to an error, error because the hard drive filled. Um, and it was actually the hard drive on a minute. So we, we used the minute, and we did um, real-time base calling. And the cool thing about the minute is it offloads a lot of the compute. So I had Python scripts running on the laptop, and it was shuttling fast queues over, and I was doing real-time adapter trimming um, and mapping. And what that allowed me to do was the next morning actually call the resistance status of all the samples that we collected um, just before. And so in this plot, unfortunately, there's quite a lot of overplotting. But in this plot, um, the red point is the positive control, the Western Cambodian sample. So these are all mutations that confer resistance to ACT in the cal gene. And you can see there's only one mutation detected, and that's um, in the Western Cambodian sample. So the controls in the Zambian samples are clean. This is um, DHFR, which con con uh, confers sulfadoxin resistance. And the Zambian samples and the Cambodian sample are mutant, and um, the lab strains are clean. So that's what you'd expect. And then with chloroquine, the Cambodian sample is uh, resistant. And actually, the Zambian samples are now sensitive. So that mutation has drifted out of the population because the drug hasn't been used for quite a long time. This isn't actually a novel finding. There's studies that have been published recently that, that noticed this. But it just confirmed that the assay was working. So since I have eight minutes, I will talk about this. So one thing that I looked into, I've, we've been back for two weeks, so uh, mercy. But um, uh, was the error rate, essentially. So since I sequenced the reference genome, I could look into that in some detail. Um, OK, so looking at Couch 13, basically the consensus error rate looks low to me. So the accuracy was 99.5% um, on Couch 13. And it's similar for the other genes. You can see that on in, in the top there. And all of the mutations are actually deletions. Um, and all of the deletions occur in homopolymers. So I just have the deletion uh, frequency, essentially, in that pileup versus the homopolymer length. And you can see they're all deletions greater of length 4. So not particularly relevant for what we're looking for anyways. Um, on the read level, it's a similar thing. So these are um, error rate distributions on per site. So we did 5,724 coding sites. Um, the mean overall error rate was 11.5%, but you know most of that is deletion. If you look at SNPs, it's only 2.6%. So we're calling SNPs, we're calling um, those bases quite competently if we ignore deletions essentially. Um, and again, the deletions are enriched in homopolymers longer than length three, um, which I think is expected. What's really cool is if you downsample that data set, so there was a lot of data, if you downsample, you can basically see that at 100 reads, so I'm plotting here um, that nucleotide identity that I showed before, that was 99.5%, um, but I'm excluding indels because I think we're justified in doing that. Um, you can see with only 100 reads, you basically have 100% 100, 100 accuracy and across all four of those genes that we sequenced. And so I, we collected around 7 million reads, so theoretically, I mean, you could put on 70K samples. What this means, essentially, is that the sequencing is not limiting how many samples you put on. It's the upstream work, or you can get a sample in three seconds. Um, yeah, so yeah, conclusion, consensus accuracy is basically 100% when you ignore deletions. Um, and the nucleotides are called with confidence. There was no ambiguity in any of them, actually. Um, and then uh, the throughput's more it's a uh, tremendous amount of multiplexing. Um, so yeah, quite happy with that. So the other experiment I'll talk about is in Kenya. So this is like 2,000 kilometers away. Um, we met with Dr. Erica Chomo in um, the Camry Research Institute on Lake Victoria. And we did a fully remote sequencing run. Um, so we went to a village on the Ugandan border in Busia. Um, 
people from uh, Eric's team collected mosquitoes from households that morning. Um, we pulled 12 of those, and then we did a sequencing run fully remotely out of the back of the Land Rover. Um, one thing I haven't talked about is that we emphasized training quite a lot, and we were running workshops everywhere we were going. And so what was really awesome was that Matthew Kipsum, so he's a, a student in Eric's lab, did the entire library prep, and this was his first ever library prep. And not only did he do the entire library prep, but he also loaded the flow cell. Um, yeah, this is the pivotal moment here. And I felt kind of bad because he was loading it in front of his supervisor, his entire lab, like half of the village, and there was a drone, and it was his first ever time. Um, but yeah, he, he nailed it, so the run looked good. Um, we actually drove with it sequencing back to the research institute, and by the time we got back, it was like three hours later, we had two gigs of data. It was mapping to Gambia and Finestis, which are the two major, major malaria vectors in the area. So yeah, I'm way under time. I had 40 slides. Um, so yeah, obviously big thanks to George and, and Isaac, um, and also to Kirk Rocket and Christina, who supported the development of the lab work in Oxford. And then Divya was amazing the whole entire time. I was like emailing her from Africa when stuff was going wrong, and she was like, you know, saving the day. So big thanks to that. And also the collaborators. You couldn't really ask for a better set of collaborators. It was, it was a real privilege to work with them. So thank you guys.